Welcome to Discovering. Congratulations to all the hunters who've already been lucky enough to bag a buck, and good luck to those who haven't yet. It's deer season, so sit back, put your feet up. It's Monday night and time for Discovering. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill. The eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure. The only way I measure Feelings that I have for this fine land There is so much to discover When you're a long-time lover Of northern Michigan Slip into my hunting boots, suit up, grab the same trusty 3030 that my dad bought me when I was 14, walk out of camp, check the wind, and head out into the woods. It's the same woods where I've cut firewood and hunted grouse, but it's all different now. Now it's time to hunt deer, and that changes everything. The unseasonably warm November weather hasn't fooled me a bit about what is to come. It's the Upper Peninsula and there is no escaping the upcoming change in temperature. I have a list a mile long of things I've managed to put off all summer. Things I know I must do before the ground turns white. Stuff to put away, wood to split, but none of that matters right now. Regardless of the urgency or importance, it can all be put off. It will be put off for two more weeks. It's deer season in the UP, and that trumps everything. It's a short distance from the door of the camp to the hunting grounds. But when I close the door and step off the porch, that mile-long list of things I need to do couldn't get further away. Hunting has certainly changed even since I've started. Different rules, different methods of hunting. So I can only imagine how it's changed since the early part of this century. I had the opportunity to talk to a hunter who could tell me firsthand. I traveled to Faithorn where I had the pleasure of visiting with Slip Carlson who turns 94 at the end of this month. But that there one had uh, 217 points on Boone and Crockett. Oh, yeah. But there was none typical. First year I was home from the Army, he had 18 points. He had 10 on one side and, uh, and uh, 8 on the other. And you see the double brow points on him? He weighed 243 pounds when he went across the, on the ferry to Lower Michigan. They had a, a checkpoint there. The guys come up here hunting, they had to take the ferry across. My cousin, they took that buck back. They wanted just bucks to show off up here. We wanted something to eat, and the bucks weren't too bad good eating. You, know? <laughs> you, wanted something, you wanted something good to eat, you had to shoot yourself. You know, it was maybe two, two and a half years old. It's a lot better. <laughs> a lot better. <laughs> I think that there's some old granddaddies yet, and they got more chance of getting by now than they have for many near years. Nobody makes drives anymore. They don't go in the dirty spots. They don't get home with all their binoculars <laughs> and uh, scopes on their rifle and stuff. You can't shoot through the brush with the damn things. You gotta, you gotta have an open spot to pull the trigger on, you know? And it used to be the drive, we carried a shotgun with us for making the drive. We never carried a rifle. 90% of the time, the, uh, the big box, they never come out on the drive. They try to run back in between the drivers. Mm -hmm. Try to use buckshot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a firm believer. I don't have to be that good of a hunter. You go out and you spend 10, 10 12 hours in that woods. And don't go running through and bumping into trees and stuff. But just go out, walk a little bit, sit a little bit, find some, uh, 
scrapes or rubs or a lot of runaways crossing. <clears throat> Spend a little time there when you get cold, move nice and slow and you warm up, moving slow, mm -hmm. better than you do if you're moving fast. That's the way I hunt. The way they hunt today, you can't walk through the woods, you're slipping on the pumpkin. <laughs>
that's when I could see the whole thing unfold. I could see the deer tumbling down the hill, and then I could see that wolf hanging off of its neck. Well, this year, no such encounter, but she did top last year's eight-pointer with an 11. Well, it was about a quarter to five yesterday, and all of a sudden, um, I had my grunt call, and so I was grunting, and I had some does down by my stand, and uh, all of a sudden, I heard some brush rumble, and then all of a sudden, I see this guy show up, and I almost flipped right out of my tree stand when I saw the horn, the antlers, and... Uh, I grunted him in, I did a snort wheeze, and he came right in to where the does were, and I didn't focus too much in the antlers. I focused on the shot, and I got the sights on right behind his left front shoulder, and I let him have it, and I watched him bolt. He ran maybe about 85 yards and got on the blood trail, and I was following it, and then I found him, and I got him out, and I dragged him out, and then, well, here he is now, and we weighed him in at 181 pounds field dress. He's got a 15-inch inside spread. He's got about a 4-inch kicker tine here, and four inch brow tines. I think as long as tine, we measured it as well nine inches. Technically what I wasn't even using a real deer call. I had like a hog grunting call because they sound more like a pig when they're going through the brush and all the other calls that I had, you know, from before. I mean, they don't really sound like, you know, when I hear, you know, younger bucks come through the brush, they weren't really as, ac they don't, the calls don't sound as accurate as the real deer, but I found one that it's an actually, it's actually a hog call that I use. So it sounded more like a pig because when this one was coming in, he, that's what he sounded like. It sounded like a pig coming in when he was grunting. And so I grunted him, I grunted him in and I did a snort wheeze on him and he came puffing through the brush. So his hair was standing up in the back of his, on the back of his neck and like he was ready for a fight. And then he came in and he was eating a little bit and he got a nice broadside shot on him. And then I let him have it. <laughs> I'm so used to drawing these things on a, a piece of paper because being a wildlife artist, but then to actually see one come out in the woods and then it comes right into your stand and you shoot it and then you see it laying on the ground and you're trying to drag it out. That's a, that's a whole new other experience. <laughs> I'm pretty speechless right now. I've never shot a buck this big. This is the biggest buck I've ever gotten in my whole 13 years of hunting. <laughs> My sister, I'll tell you a true story. She had two boys. She come up here with them. The first, her first husband died. They were eight, nine, ten years old. She said, I want you to teach my boys how to shoot and how to hunt. Well, I said, you're going to leave them up here for the summer? She said, no, I'm just up here for the weekend. I said, don't leave them off. Take them back to home. <laughs> There is no way that I can take a young fella on a weekend and teach him how to hunt and how to handle a rifle. No way. I would take him out in the woods and he had to stay with me. And I wouldn't, I told Andy, you ask Andy when I started taking him out, I took him out and I put blood on him from the buck when we, I made him follow that wounded buck. It wasn't wounded, it was shot right through the chest. But where it run, and I came in to get help to drag it out of the swamp. And Andy, Lorraine was carrying Andy on a backpack. And he was saying, where is it, Grandpa? Where is it? He was, well, maybe five years old. So I said to his mother, I said, you take him on that pack you got on his back. I got down, I said, you make some circles in the snow there. And you find some tracks with blood on them, who will follow them. You've, time you start to learn how to hunt. He circled around and he said, I found some blood, I found some blood. Well, I said, follow him. He went the wrong way. <laughs> so I had to explain to him about go which way the attacks are pointing. <laughs> he would come up that buck and he, he loved that buck. He took it that he got that buck. He hugged it. Oh. And I took him, got blood on my hands and I put it on his face. I said, now you're a hunter. <laughs> <laughs> More from Slip in a Bit. The walls of many a UP camp are decorated with reminders of successful deer hunts from the past. Here's a few tips from Tim Garenshin of North Country Legends Taxidermy in Escanaba on proper care of your prized mounts. What I'm going to do first is clean, clean the, the coat of the animal. So I'm just going to lightly, with the grain of the hair, blow the dust off the mount. I'm running about 60 pounds of pressure here. If you're losing a few hairs here and there, it's nothing to be concerned about. If you're losing dozens of them while you blow on it, you probably ought to reconsider using the compressed air. Uh, you can also use a hair dryer on a high setting with low heat. 
So the next thing we're going to do, we're going to turn our attention to the antlers. And I'm just taking a soft cloth and I'm going to dust them. I'm just going to take a piece of paper towel and dampen that with some mop and glow. Down at the bottom where it's, it's knobby, you're going to kind of have to press it on there. If you try and wipe too much, you're just going to shred the paper towel. Now this will impart a pretty heavy shine to it if you put a heavy coat and leave it dry. If you don't want them to be that glossy, as soon as you wipe that on, then come back with a dry one and wipe most of it off. It's probably the most natural look if you kind of just turn around and wipe it. You don't really want to let it pool because it will dry a little bit with a white cast to it. And that's pretty good. That's leaving us a good, nice, polished, natural look to the antlers. The next area we're going to look at is the eyes. And I'm just using another commonly available product, a Windex or Glass Plus. You don't want to get a lot of solvents around the painted area on the leather around the eye. You know, hold tight right to the edges, staying on the glass. And come back with a soft rag and buff that out. The sole of the mount is the eyes, and if the eyes are dirty, you'll be surprised how much difference it'll make. It'll bring so much more life into that mount if you got a nice, nice, clean eye. On all the mounts that I put together, I, I redo all the, all the texture on the nose pad. And so from time to time, you'll get some dust in between the nodules that, that doesn't want to come out. So what I'm using here is just, it's an orange oil-based furniture cleaner. Again, just dampen a paper towel a little bit and then just wipe that. It's okay if you get a little bit on the hair, it's not going to hurt it. And you can come back with your soft rag, kind of buff that out. This next one is, is a show horse shine. You can find them at like a tractor supply. Mel's Loud and Garden carries them as well. It's a hair conditioner. Going to remove any excess dust that might be in there to apply it. I'm just going to spray it directly on there. When you do it, be careful not to spray it on the eye. It does come off, but you really got to polish it off. So just cover the eye. You can either spray it directly on the hair, which is what I normally do, or you can use a, use a rag. Dampen the entire mount. Come back with a paper towel or you can use a soft rag equally as well. And just kind of wipe with the grain of the hair. It actually will help groom it as well. If you got some areas of the hair that are kind of sticking up out of place, once you spray the show sheen on there, you can come back. I usually just use like a, a soft brass brush and brush the hair back down into place. If you have one that's really dirty, just keep repeating the process. Just spray and then wipe with the paper towel and you'll be able to see the dirt coming off and then just repeat it with a clean paper towel. Keep repeating it and repeating it and after a while you'll get, you'll get a good portion of the dirt off of it. Yeah, I tell you, I got a box that I built. It's insulated. It's made out of waterproof plywood. And if they ever pass that, they're gonna take your guns away. I'm gonna grease them good up with some axle grease from the, my farming days and I'm gonna bury that sucker in the woods. They're not taking my gun. <laughs> I'll say like old Charlton has for, when he held that gun up from my dead and nerveless hand. <laughs> Come and get her. They ain't taking my gun. I'm with you. Absolutely. <laughs> That's your car. As long as I can get up in the morning and get out in the woods, I'm going out in the woods. And I told Mom, she said, where are you going hunting? And I said, wherever I think the deer are. <laughs> and she said, what if something happens to you? I said, don't do nothing for three days. I might be on a wounded buck <laughs> and trailing them. I said, in three days, I said, do you talk to some of them young fellas that roam around on these cars and these side roads and stuff? And they find my pickup truck, tell them to tell you where it is. You go out where that pickup truck is, I said, and you stand there, just when it turns daylight in the morning. And you'll see the raven circle. When they come down, you go over there and that's where I'll be. <laughs> but you gotta wait three days. Well, at least don't. I don't want nobody out there looking for me and I'm just taking a rest. But now I know where he's at. He's back here in our lab. <laughs> But you don't know either. I might wound a buck, and if I get on that buck, I ain't leaving it. I stick with it till I get it. That used to be, yeah. Uh... I can still do it. It might take me a little longer with the hell. <laughs> I like. I like to think that. Uh, I never miss too much. I told my kids when uh, my working days are over and my time has come to pass, 
I don't want any tears. I want you to come up and take a look at me when I'm laying there and say, that old fart never missed too much. <laughs> <laughs> and I still live by that. I told my wife, don't worry about me. I said, I ain't going till I'm ready. And the old fella comes after me, he better send help. Because I'm going to hold on to every tree and brush and uh, steel posts and everything that I go by. I, I ain't going peacefully. I still have a good time. <laughs> and I tell you, it's worked for me so far. There are damn few guys that made three amphibious landings and are still running on the face of this earth. Yeah. There's two things you should be really for live through life and have a good time. One is to be lucky and the other thing is don't let nothing bother you. <laughs> 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 How much will hunting change in the years to come? Will it be better? Worse? How will the next generation of hunters shape its future? How will they hunt? What shape will our deer herd be in 10, 20, or 50 years from now? Many of the changes that will happen over the next several years will indeed be influenced by what we as hunters do today, by what we teach that next generation. If I'm lucky enough to be sitting in a chair at 94 years old, talking to some guy with a camera, I hope I'll have my own list of stories that I'm proud to tell. And I hope that I can look back at my life and be as happy as Slip. We've been married 67 years, and I never said hard luck story, complain about this, if I wouldn't have done this, I would have did this or something, never. What I did in my life is part of my living. If you don't hit some bumps in the road, you'll never know whether you lived or not and what it felt like to hit a bump. You gotta hit a bump. Sometimes they're a little rougher than others. Maybe they end up all a good ending, but they all end up in the same place anyway. You might just well enjoy it. It's worked for me. Uh, worked for me. Well, that's it for tonight. If you'd like to keep tabs on what's coming up on Discovering or see where we've been, you can join us on Facebook or go to 906outdoors.com. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week right here on Discovering. Discovering.